Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. Oh, we got a, a busy one today. I came in the newsrooms just a buzzing. There's just stuff breaking on the federal, provincial, and municipal fronts. We got three levels of government with things for me to go on about and rant about and dissect and all that good stuff. It's kind of a, a morbid thing. Yes, I enjoy, t- you know, tumultuous or crazy political times. It keeps me uh, active, gives me lots of stuff to go on about. Good times would be boring and dull and and leave me little to report. I don't think we have to worry, though. There's always going to be more stuff for me to go on about. I got a good guest coming on today, uh, Erica Baruti. She's the senator-elect for Alberta. I'll get her to kind of explain for the non-Albertan viewers why we have these elected senators. They rarely actually end up in the Senate, but we do try to elect them anyways. And and she's going to talk about the latest Senate appointments and a bit on the Senate system because there's some confusion I saw some people not quite sure how the Canadian system works and it is kind of a, a messed up system so the the uh, confusion's understandable so yes this is uh, for those watching live use that comment scroll I see Mr. Stanley and Paradoxy saying hello yeah say hi in there I don't necessarily read them all out I do see them all there though Mavis there uh chat with each other get those questions to me and the guest i don't necessarily get to them all but i see them and it helps model the show i like it being interactive there's more than just me talking at a camera here all right but i am going to talk at the camera here for a minute get on with what i'm ranting about for some of you who watch me on x you've seen this debate going on a little bit over the weekend i thought i'm going to expand a little bit on it because uh yeah it's it's something i got personal experience with and it's it's really stupid so these are things i like to rant about so the alberta government and the federal government they've actually teamed up on something and they're going to provide internet service to rural areas at a cost 5,300 percent higher than it would be if people just got the service themselves it's nuts and the program should be scrapped but Let's get into it. Like Access to high-speed internet has been a need for modern living, fair enough, much like telephone service has. I mean, it's changed. And uh, like the early days of telephone services, rural areas, they take longer to get the infrastructure. You know, there used to be party lines until surprisingly not too long ago. Living in rural areas is a choice, and residents in them understand it won't. Uh, you won't necessarily have access to as many services or as quickly as urban dwellers do, or at least they should understand that. Now, I live near a pretty massive urban center, but I'm on a rural property, and our quest for decent internet access has been long and painful. Well, cities have had cable and fiber optic internet options for decades now. Lots of rural areas have had terrible provision, if any options at all. At my place, we had to set up a small tower on the roof to receive this wireless signal, which provided unstable, slow internet service at a high cost and terrible customer service. We then switched to using a hub to get service through our cellular provider. That was expensive and pointless as the local cell tower couldn't keep up with demand and the speeds were nearly as bad as dial-up if they weren't totally crashed. Now, despite being only 800 meters from a fiber optic cable on a nearby highway, we can't get fiber optic services because it's too expensive for any provider to install a stub line down in my community. Fiber optic cable is difficult and expensive to put down. It's not like copper power wires or telephone lines. Finally, though, we heard about this new option a few years ago. Starlink was offering high-speed service. It was going to cost $700 for the hardware, and we'd have to go on a waiting list. We eagerly jumped on the option, and when the unit finally arrived six months later, we set it up on the roof of our house with some trepidation. Our home's surrounded by trees, and I'm in a valley, so we were worried the satellite system might not work well. Our fears were unfounded. The system was true plug and play. You just place it on the roof, power it up, and it orients itself to the best signal. It's almost creepy. There's no need for a professional installation or tedious aiming in the dish like with your satellite TV services and other internet options. And best of all, we immediately had high-speed internet service. And that speed and reliability has only gotten better since we put it up there, even though most of our neighbors now have Starlink as well. It's not overloading the system. Now it's a little depressing that this, the price has fallen to $200 for a system now, and you don't need to have a contract, but that's fine. Good for those who waited. Now let's look at what the provincial and federal governments have been up to in the issue. Well, governments at every level have been promising to bring high-speed internet to rural areas for over a decade. It's a popular promise to make, but apparently a difficult one to keep. Until Starlink came, Starlink came all that most rural dwell, dwellers saw were promises and spending announcements. And most didn't even see that because our internet was too crappy to surf the news and find out. The promised spending has been significant, though. The Alberta government partnered with the federal government to spend $780 million on what they're calling the Alberta Broadband Fund. In bits and pieces, they figure they're going to bring high-speed internet service to the entire rural Alberta population by 2030 or so. Yeah, right up, you know, when we all go to electric cars. Then they break that fund up to make grand announcements. Like the one last June, trumpeting, they're going to bring high-speed internet to 1,440 rural Alberta homes for the low price of $10,625 per household. That's not a typo. Only the government could manage to take a service that 
cost $200 per household, and managed to soak taxpayers for $10,625. The announcement didn't provide a timeline either, so we can assume it would probably be a few years before those 1,400 or 14,000 homes see this new service. In the meantime, the $200 Starlink option usually arrives within a couple of weeks of ordering it. There's no more waiting times. It's available in every part of the province. Now, on top of that last announcement, the government still has $620 million laying around dedicated to this project of high-speed internet. The Starlink dishes are appearing on rooftops like daisies already. Rural citizens aren't waiting for the government to provide something in years that they can get now in weeks. The government's definition of high speed, by the way, is 50 megabytes per second. Starlink's already at over 100 meg megabytes per second. It, it's just not even in the realm. Some people are claiming we shouldn't become dependent on a service provided by a billionaire like Elon Musk. Well, I hate to break it to you guys, but the government isn't providing local mom and pop internet, internet providers. You're going to be just a dependent on a different bunch of billionaires. <clears throat> With the Rogers internet crash and periodic internet service losses due to fiber optic strikes, let's not pretend that non-Starlink options are any more reliable. Governments like to pretend they've operated top efficiency and there's no room for cuts anywhere. And of course we know that's bunk. Well, here's an area for an easy cut. With the Universal Broadband Fund, we could just cut that now. Nationally, it's $3.2 billion. Sure, there's some contracts that have to be bought out, but hey, why throw good money after bad? By the time the government manages to string those internet services to rural homes, most have already gotten satellite internet anyways. It's like laying out landlines to new urban houses for phones that are never going to be used. We need to call out and dump this fund now. It's flushing tax dollars down the toilet that, yeah, we could probably send spend somewhere uh, else for a better funds. One thing Paradox is saying, bring on the EMP. I think you're talking about the electromagnetic thing that would knock out the satellites and leave us all lacking. Uh, yeah, but if that happened... It would blow out the, the internet on every service we've got, and uh, the satellite service would be the least of our problems. All right, enough out of me. That was a long one out of me. We got Dave Naylor, our news editor, in the room, and lots to cover there, too. How's it going, Dave? Oh, it's crazy, Corey. It's nice to come in here and have a 10-minute break. Yeah, <laughs> to hide from the, the, the shouting over yeah, in the corner exactly. of the newsroom there. So kickoff is tomorrow, new yes. NFL season. So this is the first time I'll be able to get to, to mock you on your, your Steelers. <laughs> Uh, what's the over-under for a quarterback, uh, Steelers quarterback, uh, raping a maid in a hotel this year? Well, it's down now that Mr. Roethlisberger has moved along. Oh, We've got oh. the, the leftovers from your old oh, team, Seattle. You mean, you mean God's team, <laughs> the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> we were happy to get rid of uh, Russell Wilson years ago, oh. and he was completely useless in Denver. So now you've got him. What are you expecting? Well, this is the way it works in football, right? They suddenly wake up in a new environment and blossom. And he'll throw it to that lack of wide receivers that the Steelers have sitting out the uh, backfield as it sits anyways. And he'll eventually get crushed by the terrible offensive line the Steelers have. And I'll cry and complain about it through the rest of the season. There you go. I look forward to your whining. <laughs> uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It's a crazy news day. Where to begin? Uh, the breakup, the big breakup. Uh, Jagmeet Singh and uh, Justin Trudeau are no longer an item. Uh, Jagmeet tore up their uh, supply deal today. Uh, so it doesn't mean an election immediately. They're going to go bill by bill, uh, and uh, they're going to have to try and get in NDP support for every bill they pass. And if it's a confidence motion and they pull it, we could have an election at uh, any point yet. But uh, a new poll out today puts uh, sort of a damper on immediate election talks because uh, the Tories are at uh, 20, was it 22 percent now ahead of uh, the Liberals? And uh, polling has, uh, uh, when you put that in the seats, the Liberals will only have 25 seats uh, if an election is called today, and the uh, the NDP not much better. So, and those are historic lows. So, uh, whatever uh, Trudeau's trying to do to get his numbers up, it ain't working. Uh, the other big story is the Green Line, and the uh, the pr province has put the uh, put the boots to it. Uh, this is the big plan for Calgary's expanded uh, LRT system. Uh, the government has announced that no more money. Uh, and the past money that we've uh, said we were going to provide, no chance because uh, you need. They're bringing in consultants, and they're going to have a, a whole rethink about it. Uh, Mayor Gondek issued a statement saying, "Well, we just can't afford it uh, any longer uh, with uh, with with all this stuff." And uh, we've got another school massacre on the go, Corey, in the United States in a small town in Georgia called Winder at a, at a high school. Got reports of uh, four uh, four fatalities and more than 30 uh, uh, students wounded, uh, all by a student age gunman who is now in custody. And uh, Costco must have just realized that I'm a new member, so they're raising the membership fees uh, for the first time in seven years. Uh, and the other big story is the trade war with China. I'll leave that to uh, 
our business expert, uh, Sean Polzer, who'll be in there uh, in later to talk to you about uh, the canola concerns out on the West. And uh, how Western farmers, once again, will face the brunt of it. Yeah, well, Western farmers get to pay for Trudeau's Eastern playing in the markets. Uh, the usual exactly. setup. At least with Costco, seven years, that's not bad for the prices to go up on something, in all honesty. I mean, I know you don't like it when you see it on your own wallet, but everything else has been going everything up on the month. And in fairness, they've kept the hot dogs the same price. Oh, well. And they've kept the uh, roast chicken the same price. There so you go. So can't blame them, really. The important incentives are still well-priced. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'll see you after the show. Thanks, Roy. Right on. That is our news editor, Dave Naylor. And yes, big ones breaking today. And uh, again, you know, as I said, that newsroom is busy. There's shouting, there's hollering going on there. Eh, most of it's not the news guys, but I won't go into details of what that's about. All the same, the reason we can cover these, get that news out there as it's breaking is because you guys have been subscribing. It's $9.99 a month, 100 bucks for a year, guys. Well worth it. Like a newspaper subscription. Keeps us independent. We don't take tax dollars. We don't want to take tax dollars. If you've subscribed already, thank you. If you haven't yet, get on there. WesternStandard.news slash subscription. Take one out. Tell your friends to get on board. This is the future of media, guys. Uh, the old ways are gone. The dinosaurs are finally fading away. And maybe we'll get an election to finally get rid of the CBC. We'll see if Polyev follows through on that promise. You know, I'm going to go on a sidetrack. And I, I, I just heard about that when Dave came in here with this, this latest school shooting, this massacre down in the States in Georgia. And, of course, it's awful. I, I hope it's settled. There's a problem down there. And it's a, the, the thing is, though, it's a, it's a cultural problem. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is. I don't. But people point to the guns. That's the, the, the instinctive reaction to these awful, awful tragedies we get all the time. They, oh, the Americans have all those guns. That's why this happens predominantly in the States. Yeah, you know, the guns are an element of the, the, the crime, and, it, and it's a part of it. But people often forget Canada actually is the seventh most civilian armed country in the world. We, we have millions and millions of firearms in Canada. We have handguns. We have rifles. We have lots. Many, many people have firearms. But we aren't getting, and I understand we have a smaller population, of course. But still, even on the scale of it, we aren't getting those kinds of, of things happening here. So it's not a matter of the firearms itself. There's something culturally wrong. I don't know what it is. I don't. But you see, I, I hope that some brilliant person can come up and, and try to find a way and figure out what motivates an, an individual to go out and, and, and murder fellow human beings like that and, and somehow fix it. I don't know how you find that out. I don't know how you deal with it. But I know the one way not to deal with it is worrying about the tool they used. As I said, if it was just firearms alone, Canada would be having those shootings all the time too. And thankfully, we don't. But we have many, many firearms for now. The Liberals might want to change that. But so let's make sure we point and try to find what the real root of the problem is instead of pointing at what is more immediate and, and seems more simple because obviously that's not the case. There's something more to it, something more complicated. Either way, I, I hate hearing about those, particularly with schools. It's just so, so awful. And, uh, you know, it keeps happening and, and it, it just... Uh, Makes it difficult to work in a newsroom at times when things are breaking out like that. You know, we got lots of other things. That's why, you know, sometimes people get on our case. Why, why are you reporting on light stuff like, you know, yeah, the raising of Costco rates or the price of hot dogs in there? Well, because you need to break it up, guys. We can't have nothing but bad news all the bloody time or political news, which going into the drudgery of things. And uh, I'll torment you with our Senate-elect uh, Erica Baroudi's on that sort of thing right away here. Actually, we like that sort of stuff. It's not necessarily bad, but you know what I mean. Got to break it up. We got to spread it out. So yes, we cover a little bit of everything here from the price of hot dogs at Costco to unfortunately tragic, terrible events down in the United States. That's just part of covering a, a broad variety of news. Either way, let's hope that the, the, the the death count doesn't rise any further down there and, and that they've got this uh, as resolved as it possibly can be. It's uh, a, a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, you know, uh, before I, I, I get to Ms. Baroudi's there is, is uh, uh, yeah, we, we got some pretty crazy stuff going on in the federal parliament. Jagmeet Singh is finally implying that he might show some courage and hold the government to account. I'm in the I'll believe it when I see it mode. He says he's just going to take it bill by bill now. Well, that's all he's ever done. So he'll stomp his little feet and he'll pretend to act strong and he'll pass every bill all the way along until they have to hold an election a year or possibly more from now. But either way, we've held elections for something else in Alberta for, for many years. It's been a tradition actually for a long time. And occasionally the senators we choose end up in the Senate often they kind of sit there and waiting uh, and never quite get there. But uh, 
we have one of those elected senators here, uh, Erica Baruttis, and she's joining the show. She's been on before, and it's overdue. And uh, yes, because our prime minister just appointed two senators in Alberta to represent us in the Senate that really, as far as I could tell, don't represent many Albertans whatsoever. So thank you very much for, for joining me today, uh, uh, Ms. Baruttis. Uh, I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I like that you said it's long overdue. I'm always happy to join. Yeah, right on. So, I mean, maybe, you know, because some people are from some outside of Alberta viewing the show and such. Can you kind of can give in a nutshell what the deal is with elected senators in Alberta, what your role is and, and uh, what we're hoping for? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you talked about how we have had a history of elected senators in Alberta um, in 20, between 2012 and 2015, we actually had two of the three in the last, last uh, Senate election be appointed. Um, the reason why it kind of came to be was wanting to have a voice for Albertans, which is the role of Senate. It's not a specific group. It's not a, a woke agenda item. Um, it is actually about having a voice for uh, the, the entire province. And so in 2021, aligned with the last municipal election, uh, there was several of us, uh, three of us, which ran under the Conservative Party of Canada under new legislative changes by then Premier Jason Kenney and uh, a whole slew of independents that wanted again to be able to stand up for Alberta in the upper chamber, in the red chamber, uh, to make sure that when bills are passing that our region is definitely considered and that perspective is being brought. Now, fast forward from 2015 to 29 or uh, from 2015 till now, we've had Justin Trudeau, who I'm not even sure if he believes in the Senate, um, but who hasn't respected Alberta's uh, elected senators. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper did, but we've had an individual named Mike Shake, who sat for a very long time. Uh, who knows if that'll be my, my future as well. But we do have three individuals that were elected by Albertans with, I'll say, quite large numbers. It's, it's larger than... Um, you know, any leader, any premier, any political party individual gets. Um, so there was a big uptake by Albertans to to actually elect and vote for these individuals. So, I mean, a lot of uh, when I talk to Americans, they're, they're just flabbergasted that we actually appoint our senators. I mean, how on earth could you possibly that, that how, how undemocratic do you get? Well, yeah, I'm afraid that that's the reality. Uh to kind of work around or make that uh, sugarcoated a bit, I mean, Prime Minister Trudeau mm -hmm. has claimed all the senators he, he's elected now are independents. They aren't party senators. Uh, it's a little hard to believe, isn't it? Well, it is, especially with the most recent appointment in Daryl Finlatter. He has been a conservative fundraiser. Uh, even when he was a member of the PC party in Alberta, it was a federal liberal fundraise for Justin Trudeau and the, the liberal party. So, I mean... That's one that really frustrates me because I think he does. I mean, he has a great resume from his professional career. I think a perspective he could bring, but don't call that an independence senator. Just just say you're, they're going to go join the Liberal caucus. And I think that he, uh, Justin Trudeau would actually have, hold a little bit more street cred within the, the individuals that love and respect the, the purpose of the Senate. Well, and, and another aspect of Senate abuse, and, and to be fair, over enough years, we could see some terrible examples of it from conservative and liberal governments. It's a partisan role that can be used as an incentive for people or a handout, a, a plum. Uh, and, uh, you know, somewhere it frustrates us a lot, of course, is when media members are suddenly popped in there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to speak of Charles Adler. Who, <laughs> Paula a, Simons was the first before yeah. Charles, too. <laughs> and, and others prior to that. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, it, it, you know, unfortunately, we shouldn't be seeing media members dancing around trying to w curry favor with the federal government. Uh, uh, Mike Duffy was another example. He didn't turn out to be actually he was a conservative appointee. It didn't turn out to really be uh, uh, the best senator we could hope for. Uh, if we could take away that reason for the government to appoint senators, it would bring some more honesty into that house. Yeah, I definitely think, and something I did campaign on, was the need for Senate reform. So I don't think that the Senate is currently working in the way it was either intended uh, or the way that it can best suit Albertans. We have seen a few pieces of legislation, uh, including the original you know, censorship bill that the Senate actually shut down and, and put back. So we have seen some examples where the Senate has actually acted as that sober second thought. But if you're looking at even the lay of the land of individuals that are currently senators in Alberta, 
Alberta. I think most Albertans would find it very hard to sit there and say that these individuals have a track record of standing up for the values and beliefs that our province upholds. Um, and so I think there is an argument that, you know, I'm sure you and I would both agree, mainstream media <laughs> pundit or former journalists probably aren't the best uh, candidates. But I do think that there is, you know, concern by others uh, that we also shouldn't have the the partisanship, or if you're going to be partisan, at least own it. And I think that that's some of the challenge for people that maybe don't understand or um, support what the current Senate, how it operates, and what is it, it what's its purpose. Yeah, and, and to change the structure of the Senate itself would take a constitutional reform, which is a whole bag of worms that probably would be impossible at this point. But there are superficial changes we could do. I, I was a, an old, you know, I was a young reformer at the time. Now I'm an old former reformer. Uh, the big rallying call in the 90s was Triple E Senate, which was elected, effective, and, and equal. Uh, mm -hmm. The equal part would take constitutional reform. But the other two E's, if we could, if other provinces jumped on board, and if we just at least started the trend of having elected senators, I, I think it would turn them effective because they would feel, uh, you know, a mandate and, and uh, the ability to act as a senator and they'd be answering to the voters rather than to whoever appointed them. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I campaign on term limits. That is, you know, more of a personal uh, statement than, again, the ability to have a constitutional reform. Uh, you are right. There has been that triple E Senate. Um, the states, though, like I want to point out that it's not impossible to actually fully reform uh, the structure of the Senate. They started out as appointees um, and, and then shifted away. And, and now they have two per state, regardless of your size. I would love to see that. Um, but to your point, you know, there's wishful thinking and, and an ideal scenario versus what the realities and the barriers, such as constitutional reform, um, exhibits. I, I'd also love to see other provinces taking this. Now, if I was another province watching what's happening in Alberta and the lack of respect for the senators and waiting to be appointed, um, you know, it, it's probably very discouraging under this current administration that that is going to be, you know, the will of the people equals the will of what's happening in Ottawa and that those appointments, um, you know, the appointments become the symbol, but the elections become the the voice of who who folks want to be sitting in those seats. Yeah. And, and as for term limits, as you said, it would almost have to be sort of a voluntary sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I saw some people, and that's part of why I was hoping to get you on as well, just to correct some of the misconceptions, because some people are saying, well, as soon as uh, Polyev becomes prime minister, presuming he becomes prime minister, he's saying he could revoke some of those appointments or turn them over. And no, once the senator's in, uh, it's actually very difficult to remove them from that role, uh, if not impossible, until they reach retirement age. Yeah. And so it is uh, deemed an appointment for life until the age of 75. Now, um, several individuals have stepped down before. Uh, Doug Black was an example of someone, Senator Doug Black, that said, you know, in, in 10 or 12 years, like, the mandate in which I would be able to carry forward has kind of run its course. And I'd like to step aside. His hope was that one of the elected senators, as he waited till the day after our election uh, or a week after to do so, um, you know, they don't necessarily stay till 75, but I would suspect someone like Paula Simons, who probably this is the best gig of her life, isn't going to leave that seat. And a lot, unfortunately, those two vacancies that had been there for th three years are now being filled suspect it's, you know, the silver lining to me is it's uh, how scared he is that he's going to be out and all he's trying to do is make Polyev's life difficult <laughs> when he's in government. So I, I want to take away a positive from this entire experience. But I do think that a lot of the individuals that are currently there are, you know, 50, 60. So their runway um, is a little bit discouraging for me, obviously, personally, but also that we're stuck with some of these individuals that I think many Albertans would say are maybe not the best candidate. Yeah, it, 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 they could sit for a long time. And, and as Ian Leslie, one of the commenters, said, the Senate's going to be a block on whatever Polyev tries to do. Mm -hmm. That's a concern some people have, is, is we could end up at a, a majority parliament that Canadian voters selected, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, they can't pass a bill without Senate uh consent. And, and that's something else. There was some debate online. A lot of people are confused about that saying, oh, the Senate can't block bills. Yes, they can. Yeah. And, and in fact, they can do it in perpetuity. 
Yeah. And so if I can just, <laughs> I'm, and I think you know this, I'm developing an applied politics course uh, to teach individuals all of these things at Macamie College. So I'll do a little plug there because we're going to be launching our pilot in the new year. Um, but that's exactly it. Is there's first reading, second reading, it goes to committee. Um, and then the, like the step before, uh, you know, in the process, it's got to go to the other house. And so another thing people don't know is that actually the upper chamber of the Senate can introduce their own private members bills. Um, and that would require that they can pass it within their house and then send it. But yes, absolutely. We saw it with, um, I think it was C11. Uh, we've seen it, you know, with amendments coming back, like there is a strategic move here that Trudeau is doing to create this blockage for many of, uh, I suspect, Polyev's um, policies and legislation that he's going to try passing or trying to, you know, water down policies, et cetera. And so I think it's actually like quite unnerving um, that he's doing this. Politics, polit by political strategist hat says it's, it's smart politics for him to do this, should he not know when he's going to get the boot. Um, but it was something that Stephen Harper missed and didn't appoint some of those Senate roles uh, and the Supreme Court appointments. But it's all signs point to Trudeau's very scared about his future and knows he's he's done soon and is trying to build up this Senate as uh, as an obstacle to democracy rather than part of the de democratic process. Yeah, and you brought up something else that's interesting. I mean, a lot of people have mentioned, you know, well, Prime Minister Harper made a terrible mistake because he left a bunch of vacant Senate spots when he went to the polls and, and thus he just left an opening for more liberals to get put in there. Um, yeah, I think strategically that was a bad move. I, I'm certain uh, if, if uh, he, I, I can only guess he was more confident that he might be in for another term. But when a Senate vacancy happens, as you pointed out, some were vacant for three years. It's not the same as when a, a House of Commons seats open up and they have to hold a by-election within six months. They can keep those seats empty until it's practical for them, which, again, is ridiculous. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when we started running in 2000 and, or 2021, um, there was two vacancies. And then during it, I mean, talk about a slap to the face for the, regardless of if they were running under the conservative banner, which I was, or independents, people that were like going from all four corners of our province, trying to edge, like most of the time I felt we were educating that we have a Senate and that a Senate exists and what its powers were. So I felt I was doing a, a service to grade six democracy class, um, but also talking about the value of the Senate and how we need to reform it. And that like, there is, there is some opportunity here. But as we were mid campaigning, he appointed Karen Swanson, who uh, is known for her selfies with Trudeau when she was the former mayor of Banff. And so that went down to one, didn't appoint both. And then obviously Doug Black resigned. And then from then, from 2021, he hasn't appointed anyone in Alberta. And so he left those sitting, I don't know if it was like, you know, to to punish us uh, and make us feel like there was hope. But um, I can just say that now he's going through his list um, and trying to appoint as many people to drive his narrative. I mean, the other individual, Chris Wells, doesn't have necessarily uh, clear party allegiance, but, you know, isn't really speaking for all Albertans. He has one agenda, one agenda only, and he's running on, you know, his desire to bring wokeism to the upper chamber. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Walls is, is he would be more akin to an NDP type selection if they uh, exactly. played in, in my view. Uh, but I mean, it's interesting and, and it's frustrating with the games played. Uh, the appointment of historians and the timing of it was a political middle finger to Albertans. It was his Absolutely. way of saying, I'm going to choose now just to let you all know that I think you're pissing in the wind and I will choose your senators, you know, no matter what you guys try to do. And it just shows some of the, the, the spite, I think, to a degree between the federal government and the provinces. Yeah, I mean, I will say, so when Trudeau got in, he said that there needs to be some type of changes. He created his own application process. Myself and the other two, top, like the top three um, uh, candidates of the Senate race all applied through his process. I can tell you, I think I did more background information for my Costco membership um, than I did for the Senate application. It was basically a resume and some some reference letters. Um, it wasn't robust and nor was it reflection, a reflection of, you know, what qualities and characteristics you would be bringing to the upper chamber. Um, 
But I also haven't heard from any of the recent ones, Charles Adler included, who is new to Mon Manitoba's Senate and has actually, you know, said he doesn't believe in the Senate. He believes it should be abolished and now is getting a pretty good paycheck to uh, uh, sit there and um, sit sit in that house. I don't think that they I don't know if any of them, especially the two in in Alberta, actually went through that process. I know Paula Simons did and I know Karen Swanson did because they've shared that. None of these these three recent appointments have shared um, if they went through his process. So, I mean, an, again, not only a slap, but even a more a bigger slap to democracy and a hypocritical action by by Trudeau. Yeah, and the, the the process is token at best. Well, mm -hmm. before I, I let you go, then you're you're not just going to sit idly staring at the computer waiting nope. until you get your Senate seat. You've been working on other things in the meantime, as you alluded to. You, you've got something on the go in in the college. Uh, can I, you know, get your plug out there? And, and where can people, uh, you know, see what you're up to and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will never uh, stop relentlessly standing up for Alberta. Um, it might just be me being a senator and waiting longer, uh, but my aspirations to get there and be able to move the uh, Alberta agenda will will stick with me until um, probably the rest of my life. But when it comes to what I'm doing now, I recognize that for my years, my 20 plus years in politics, working on campaigns, as well as uh, working within the legislature and for political parties, um, that there was a really big need to start teaching those those skills. I have a poli sci degree and I can guarantee there's very few from my political science degree uh, that I actually applied to my career and definitely did not help me get my foot in the door to have a career in politics. So we've created at Macme College the Applied Politics and Public Affairs Specialist uh, Diploma Program. Two years, you should be able to learn everything from briefing notes to stakeholder relations to event planning. You'll learn how to run and win campaigns. Um, and so we're bringing together a group of experts in those respected areas to teach this program um, and hopefully get that will for democracy, the excitement around politics, and, and the divisiveness in which we see um, shrink while we grow the ability for people to engage in the process. Well, excellent. I hope you get packed classes, and I know we need a lot more people to get a little more knowledge in that field. Absolutely. So I appreciate you coming on. I do hope you get into the Senate because I want to see Me the too. people who were elected get in there. It's not that big an ask, you would think. So uh, uh, thank you again for clarifying a lot of that and for, for putting your name out there. And uh, I, I hope it happens, and I hope we uh, get to talk again sometime soon. Yeah, thanks so much, Corey. Great, thank you. So that is Alberta Senator-elect Erica Baroudis. And as you can hear, yes, she's quite busy on a lot of the other things. And I, I'm seeing some of the things in the discussion scroll going on that shows confusion about the Senate. Um, you know, some of the discussion between Mr. Stanley, I see, and Ian Leslie uh, saying, you know, why do we need a Senate? And Ian Leslie saying it's a breaking system on a majority government. Uh, both are kind of yeses in a sense. Yes, technically it should be. But because it's unaccountable, because it's appointed, because they, you know, uh, answer to it. I mean, uh, Mr. Stanley said, who does the Senate serve? And Ian Leslie said, Canadians. Okay. Theoretically, yes, but they don't. If you aren't elected, you don't serve Canadians. You serve whoever appointed you. It's a Senate with a theoretical use, but because it's been abused the way it has, has become a, a sad shadow of what it should be. It should be a second house to make a check on what's going on. It should help for regional balance. So if you look at the American system, which yeah, again, has many, many challenges, uh, it's equal. There's two senators per state, no matter what, and they're elected. So Idaho has as many senators as California or New York. And meanwhile, of course, with Congress, they, then it's based on population. So this way, though, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana can all get together and jam something through because it won't pass Congress because the populated states won't get, you know, won't support it. Likewise, the populated states can't override and crush the lesser populated states because the Senate won't pass those things, or at least that's the theory and how it's supposed to work. And it certainly works more effectively in Canada's. Canada's is just kind of a mismatch of, of, of a number of senators all over. And again, as usual, it's dominated in Quebec and, and the East. The West gets a very bad shake out of it. Uh, Dave uh, Keen saying they can legislate the power of the Senate to basically zero. No, they can't actually. It's very, very constitutionally entrenched what the Senate can do. We can't do a heck of a lot. If we're talking about the governor general, that's one of the things I think we can defund her down to next to nothing. You can't get rid of the role. You can't get rid of the theoretical power, but you could at least 
stop the lavish travel on her part. But uh, the Senate, unfortunately, is is a mess. Uh, Mr. Stanley saying appointed by who? By the Prime Minister. That's the one and only person. Well, or if you start playing with the formalities of things, the, the senators are appointed by the Governor General on the recommendation of the Prime Minister, blah, blah, blah. It's the Prime Minister. It, that, that's all there is to it. The, the Governor General never says no. Never. It, it's it's a, another token role. So we've got a system that's a, a semi- democracy. If you want to listen to my dreamland thing, if we somehow tore Canada's constitution apart and rebuilt it and built a second house, a Senate, I'd love to see one that was equally dispersed across the country. People talk about proportional representation. I wouldn't want to see one level elected by proportional representation, but you know, we could have one house elected by it. Maybe have 10 senators per province and they were elected and not for until the age of 75. They had to face it every four years. And you had proportional representation there. Maybe we can have a whole different thing there. But, I mean, that's dreamland. As it is right now, what we have is this, this appointed Senate that does the, the wishes of the prime minister. And, again, it's been abused by conservative and liberal governments, uh, both. I mean, Mulroney stacked the Senate to get uh, the GST shoved through in the past. You can't point a finger to any government being good with it. In the meantime, though, one of the things we can do, and that was way back in Mulroney's days with Stan Waters. He was the first elected senator. We can elect him. We can go through the motions. We can at least let the provincial voters choose, and a willing prime minister can put them in. But uh, that's a stopgap thing. Until the Constitution's reformed, it's always just going to be more of an honor system on the part of the prime minister to deal with. All right, let's check in with our business and energy fella, Sean Pulzer. I know you've been busy in there with everything breaking. They forced you to watch that Trudeau conference. I might condolence. It was the, you know, 15 minutes of my life. I'll never get back. Oh, his voice. I just can't take it. I turned around. I looked. And I saw you seated in front of the TV and Trudeau. And they're like, oh, God, I got to go write my monologue. Well, I've actually been at uh, Trudeau uh, pressers here in Calgary. And he just has, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's a skillful way of, Completely avoiding the question <laughs> and using an awful lot of words. Word to salad, it. yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. Well, what else is that breaking out there? What do you got for me today? Uh, well, on the business front, we've been uh, fairly busy. So our, our old friend, uh, Robbie Starbuck, is back at it again. So yes. This time he went after Molson and Coors. So uh, back in around 2.15, Molson and Coors uh, merged, right? And yeah. You remember all the controversy with uh, Bud Light. You know, they lost $3 billion in market cap. Well, it turned, you know, and they were pitching Coors as a reasonable alternative to you yeah. know, the silver bullet to... Uh, well, well, Bud Light and Coors Light are both carbonated piss. I mean... <laughs> it, <laughs> well, it turns out that Molson Coors was uh, just as woke uh, <laughs> as Bud Light. They mm. just didn't put, uh, you know, Mulvaney on the can. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Well, it's good to see Starbucks still uh, aiming for them. I'm sure there's got to be other businesses now scrambling and saying, like, oh, we do not want to be targeted by this fellow. Let's let's get rid of our DEI garbage right now before before we're the next on the list. Well, that's pretty much exactly what happened. So uh, he's the last three times uh, he hasn't even really had to quote unquote out anybody. He's just uh, you know he sends them an email and then that's it. They they cave like the very next day. <laughs> so I don't want to hear from that guy. Well, and after Bud Light, they lost three billion dollars in sales. They were the number one brand in the U.S. like by far. Yeah, and Hauser Bush has like pretty close to about eighty percent of the U.S. beer market socked up. So it was a, it was a huge hit for them. So some people are getting smart there. Mm. Uh, the other big one that we have today is uh, the canola, you know, the EV trade war. So uh, Ottawa is protecting, uh, what is it, $50 billion in taxpayer-subsidized uh, EV plants in Ottawa and Quebec. And in the meantime, they're throwing basically canola farmers in Alberta and Saskatchewan and a lesser degree in Manitoba under the bus. Yeah, and the, the trade with China, I think, on canola is around $3 billion or something like that. It's actually like, about $3 billion in Saskatchewan alone. So yeah. across the prairies, it's closer to about 5 So, I mean, again, it just shows the regional discrepancy when he'll give a market that massive, the, the middle finger, at least throw them out, leave them hanging in the wind. Uh, yeah. to protect the central Canadian one that takes 50 billion a year or whatever in subsidies. Well, and I was talking to the vice president of uh, the wheat growers here and uh, they're based in Calgary, but he farms out uh, by Fort McLeod. And he basically said, uh, you know, the liberals don't have a rural riding. They, they barely have any ridings, you know, west of Thunder Bay, but absolutely none of them are anywhere near them. You know, like he was saying, the agriculture minister, the one that they have now, Macaulay, he says he's a nice guy, but he's from Prince Edward Island. And it's kind of like, you know, having the fisheries minister from Saskatoon, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Was, like, and they, he wasn't consulted. And, like, just the canola hit alone would be about 10% of uh, the farm receipts. 
Yeah, well, I think they're, they're taking it with an India trade war on uh, uh, lentils as well. Oh, are they? <laughs> That's no, another, we didn't, we didn't so get into that. I, I won't take you down that road, but it's, <laughs> our agricultural producers are really getting a beating with uh, Trudeau's international reputation. That, that, you know, because that's our big exports. Our big exports are resource and and uh, agricultural, even if the federal government thinks that we should change. Well, potash was only a billion dollars last year. Yeah. You know, in Saskatchewan, and, and that's a huge export for them as well, right? So the uh, value of canola sales is almost five times. <sighs> and to put it into perspective, uh, <laughs> we're talking Tesla, right? Yeah. So imports, to duties on Chinese-made EVs. There is only one Chinese-made EV that is available in the Canadian market, and that is the Tesla Model Oh, y. what a mess. <laughs> Just when and governments get in the market. 40,000 of them a year that yeah. actually come in. So, uh, you know, we're talking uh, peanuts. Yeah. yeah. All right. And finally, Costco cranked up their membership. Yeah, Dave mentioned that, yeah. Oh, Dave did, yeah. Dave's a Costco shopper, there's no doubt. I, I think he goes for the $1. fifty hot dogs. He did, he said they haven't raised the price on that, at least. But, no. But it's been a while since they raised their membership price, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it's very interesting because uh, the way their business model works, about 60% uh, of their profits actually come from membership revenues. So uh, the analysts are saying that it's structured more like, um, you know, uh, online subscription service like netflix yeah. you know so how netflix was trying to stop the double leakage on the memberships and all that kind of thing so basically you have to kind of think of costco as kind of like a netflix that sells you know gallon sized jars of toothpaste yeah well we'll see how it works for them. maybe it's a business decision they'll probably they'll lose some people who are just saying to heck with you guys i'm not going to renew but i'm others you know they should garner some revenue by others who are just gonna say well i'll take well and that was part of the, that was part of the suggestion too was uh, you know the shopping experience you know on the one hand they have to try to encourage people to come in by having low enough prices but then at the uh, on the other hand they have to harass you enough <laughs> yeah. you know at the gate and check your card and scan you and you know scribble on your receipt it's, you know to let a, you through it's a it different business model enough. yeah, yeah it's a, kind of a balancing act yeah. it'd be interesting to watch anyways all right. Well, thanks for those updates. So I'll, I'll let you get back to the newsroom and chew on whatever you, you pulled out of your, your news conference. So Trudeau, that, that looks American. What do you got there? Well, I'm heading off to Washington, D.C. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we're going to try and get, catch a Trump rally here on the weekend. <laughs> that should be fun. Watch your ears. <laughs> yeah, watch my back. Did you, <laughs> did you see that guy jump into the media stand last week? No, I haven't oh, seen Trump that. Oh, Trump says, oh, the media's the enemy. Points to see it. Oh. Next thing you know, they had to taste this guy because he jumped over the media riser. Well, I'll happily watch from afar. And Trump right? says, aren't my rallies fun? <laughs> And I hope it is for you, uh, but you don't get tackled or, or lose an ear or something. Well, you'll read all about it on Western Center. Excellent. All right, Sean. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll see you in the newsroom. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. It's Sean Polzer, yes, covering our news, energy, and Trumpism. Important things out there. Uh, yeah, so much to cover. Like I said, it's going crazy. Jagmeet Singh is posturing. But BC, I haven't even been able to touch that yet today. And boy, have an eye on that. We got a reporter out in BC, Mr. Uh, Yeager, I think the name is there. Jared. Boy, I'm terrible with names. Yes, but he's been writing excellent stuff. I just I don't look at the name all the time of the article. But no, and, and I mean, so the BC United has basically folded its tent. You've got the BC Conservatives suddenly, the, the only conservative option. The BC NDP is reaching out, trying to figure out how to pull in some of that support. There's a real neck and neck race going on out in BC for the provincial government right now. And it's a big one. I mean, this is, you know, when you're looking at a government turnover as, as radically different from NDP to conservative, and that election is just a month away, we're going to see some very interesting campaigning going on over there. And boy, unexpected. It, it gave a little bit of memories, in a sense, to to when Premier Smith um, did her, well, she wasn't Premier yet, she was the head of the Wild Rose Party, I was on the board of the party at the time, when she suddenly did her ill-fated floor crossing, thinking that would unite the Conservative parties, and uh, Jim Prentice would have this, this new united force going forward, instead the Wild Rose survived, Daniel Smith's political career we thought was dead at the time, but obviously wasn't, what a crazy fiasco, but it did lead to four years of NDP in Alberta, and uh, now where we are, politics, boy, it's, it's just a, a loony, loony world, isn't it? And uh, it's hard to keep up. But yeah, speaking to the West, speaking of uh, us taking it on the canola front, you know, you drive, you see those yellow fields, they're, they're everywhere in the West. It's, it's a huge market, as Sean said, $5 billion a year. And it is being threatened. Now, there's other buyers besides China. Of course there are. But when you lose a major, major customer like that, it hurts the market. 
dramatically. It means that they've got to find other buyers. Well, what's another buyer going to say? Yeah, I'll take that off your hands, but you know, we're going to have to change price a little bit. So they're going to get a lower return on those crops. Again, it's Trudeau's terrible diplomatic actions. Trudeau's complete lack of business sense is, is, is led to this mess. As I said, the lentil producers, it's smaller, but same sort of thing. Trudeau getting in fights with India, and meanwhile, it's the lentil producers who get it uh, on the tail end because India says, fine, we're not buying your lentils anymore because we don't export a lot. Despite Trudeau's dreams, we aren't an EV producer. We aren't an EV exporter. We aren't selling these batteries. We aren't selling these parts. So when the other countries want to shoot back at us, when they want to, during a trade war, to, you know, fire a shot at Canada, they go after the agricultural products. And guess where most of that's coming from? Yeah, us out in the West, as usual. I've said it before and I'll say it again, guys, Canada is broken. I think we kind of covered that with the, the Senate discussion, with looking at how uh, we're being shot uh, at with, uh, you know, our agricultural products because of Trudeau's mess. So Trudeau came on defiantly, though, as I said, Jagmeet Singh, uh, saying he's not, he's torn up the agreement that he had with Trudeau, and, and the, now it's just going to be policy by policy, and he could invoke an election any time. Look, he's not going to. Singh's a coward. He's a wimp. But he's posturing. He's talking. And the bottom line is the support for both of them is just going to keep tanking. But as, as others, as commenters have pointed out, and, uh, you know, as a, if we have a stacked Senate, even if it, it does end up with only 25 liberal seats. All of Canada is ready for a change. we got a whole bunch of these bums, and a bunch of them are bums, in the Senate who will block almost everything that Pierre Polyev tries to put through. If that happens, then we're looking at a constitutional crisis. We're looking at a real problem. We've got an unelected House stuck until the age of 75 in there that will not allow an elected majority to get things done. That is a broken system, and it's pretty frightening. I've proposed a way to sell it. I'll throw my own plug in at the end. Just look up uh, Corey Morgan as an author. I wrote a book on how we might be able to change that, but I won't go too far in my self-promotion on that. You can look it up for yourselves if you're not familiar with it. Lots going on. Be sure to tune in. We're going to break some more of this stuff down on the pipeline tonight with uh, Nigel Hannaford and Derek Fildebrand. And of course, uh, Nigel has a fantastic show that comes out weekly. He does channel kind of a Rex Murphy sort of feel with things. Check it out. Check out Hannaford. We're expanding our production. Share the links to our sites, guys. Get it out there. Keep tuning in. This is how we stay independent. This is how we get the news that the mainstream won't give you. Thank you all for tuning in this week. There was so much more I wanted to get to, but I just ran out of time. I will see you all again next week at this time. If the name Ted Byfield brings back fond memories, well, we got a party coming up for you guys. On September 25th, Toasting Ted is what it's called. It's going to honor a great conservative who published Alberta Report News Magazine. It's going to be bagpipes, singing, live auction stakes, speeches by Premier Smith, Preston Manning, Stephen Harper. Quite a lineup. The Western Standard is the, the final incarnation or the latest incarnation of Alberta Report that Ted Byfield uh, founded. And I mean, he was a great Albertan. He really made his mark on this province. And this, this evening of celebration for him is really going to be outstanding. You get there, toastingted.ca. That's the website. You can get your tickets. This one's going to sell out. I mean, again, if you want to see Smith, Manning, Harper, all in one spot, one night, be sure to get there.